welcome or welcome back to another episode of Tech Girl Thursdays. Today I am here with Melissa and she's going to be sharing about her experiences in computational biology and bioinformatics in the tech field. So thank you so much, Melissa, for joining me today on this Zoom call. I'm so excited to talk with you. Could you give me a short intro about yourself, your background, interests, and hobbies? I'm Melissa. I am a PhD candidate at Duke University in computational biology and bioinformatics. I received my bachelor's of science in math and in biology at Meredith College, which is a small all-women's college in, in um, North Carolina. And yeah, my interests are outside of like research and stuff. I really like gardening and um, I recently got back into crocheting and yeah. So to start off at the beginning, how did you first get into tech? Like what, what led you to kind of pursue it? Yeah, so I went to an early college high school program. So the first two years we took like our core math, science, English classes. And then the last two years we got the opportunity to take college courses at the um, college, on the college campus we were on. And so we were um, located on North Carolina Central um, University's campus. So I took math classes there because I was advanced in math from the get-go and so I had like the same math professor a couple of times for like all the calc classes and he like pulled me to the side he was like hey I think you'd be interested in like this summer research program and I was like what what is this and then he was like you'll get paid for it and I was like okay yes I mean yes, <laughs> and that was my first time like um coding and doing any kind of like analyses and so that is what got me interested in it. It was like pure happenstance. And like, it wasn't something that I knew existed until my professor basically recommended me to look at this program, so. Uh, just, I mean, in general, in life, how like some of these like random things happen. And then looking back, it's like, wow, that really like shaped just, the path going forward. Exactly, exactly. I'm still in contact with that professor and I keep him updated. And every time I remind him, like, I, pro I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you because I just probably wouldn't have figured out this field existed or would have figured out much later and been having to, like, still be getting experience to be able to be in my PhD program. So right now your research is in bioinformatics and um, computational biology. So what exactly is that. So I know um, it combines several different things to so biology, obviously, um, a bit of computer science, data science, but um, like what, what type of work are you doing with it? Computational biology is a really broad field and it's basically taking data um, and statistics and different algorithms to kind of make sense of biological phenomenon. And so to me, like the research in my program kind of falls into like three broad systems. One is like genomics and genetics or looking at um, pharmacokinetic, like how different things diffuse into your, into different systems. So like more like systems biology and then like protein biology, like modeling how proteins interact with each other and interact with other molecules. And so those are like the three main things that I always think of when I hear computational biology. Um, and for me, I work on the genomics and genetics under that umbrella. And so Specific to what I do, I research how our DNA changes or how our DNA interacts with other molecules throughout developmental time, and also how it um, reacts in, in uh, response to a psychostimulant. And the model systems that I use are in the brain. So one uh, population, neuron population, that I look at are called PV in the neurons. And my lab has previously shown that when you silence the output from those cells that mice don't form drug-like beh addictive behaviors. And so we're trying to figure out what in the, in the genome um, is changing or what, what molecules are binding to the, to the genome in those cells specifically to create those addictive-like behaviors. 
And then in the other project, I'm working in the cerebellum where we can um, easily isolate those cells and the cerebellum develops a lot postnatally. So after you're born, your cerebellum, your, your brain is still developing. Um, and so we can see throughout development when the specific cells that we're looking at are maturing, we can see how the genome is changing and is helping to regulate that maturation process. That's so cool. Uh, are you working on all of those different projects at the same time? Like how does the research process work? So my lab is, is a fairly sized lab. We have like 15-ish people right now. Um, and so most, uh, most of the way that my lab works is that there are people who go and collect the cells at the different time points and like pull down and isolate the, the genome or different things like different proteins that are attached to the genome that we're interested in. And then we send those off to sequencing where we can get DNA sequences of whatever questions we're querying and then from that, I can look at the data and then process it in a way that allows us to see what's going on. And so for me, I don't do any of the um, experimental stuff. I just get the data and go from there. Um, so that's how that like workflow happens. Just so like if we want to know what genes are expressed, what happens after we send it to sequencing, the what happens is that we can isolate a cell or cells and when we send to sequencing what we, the data that we get back are basically the DNA sequences that are expressed so A, C's, G's, and T's and there are um, different software out there to take those sequences of A, C's, G's, and T's and align it to a reference genome to tell me okay this strand belongs here that's you know this gene, gene A, and this strand belongs here, that's gene B. And so we can then use that to tally up how many of gene A's and gene B's and so forth that we, we have in that experiment. And say we wanted to see the effect of a psychostimulant versus control, we can look at the count of gene A in the control where nothing is happening, no stimulants versus the um, count of gene A strands that we have aligned in the psychostimulant um, case. So we can see, oh, when this mouse is given the psychostimulant, they have more of gene A and less of gene B. And so we can kind of put together a story that says gene A uh, plays a role here. And um, based on the different kind of genes that are expressed, that are either upregulated or downregulated, we can cluster those um, by function or um, other, other biological things to kind of put together a story of what's going on in, in those cells. And so my role in that is to take the raw sequences, align it to a reference genome, and then um, perform some statistical tests to see which genes are upregulated, which genes are downregulated. And um, what I'm moving forward into is using um, networks like um, Bayesian networks to kind of put together uh, how certain genes are dependent on each other based on the question that we're looking at. What, what type of statistical tests um, and analysis have you been doing such, are you planning on doing? Yeah, so um, for looking at differential gene expression, um, because there, I think there are like 20-ish thousand genes in the mouse genome, because there's so many genes, um, just a regular t-test would have like a high false positive rate. And so it's really important to understand the data and know the different um, assumptions that you're making about it with um, differential gene analysis. And so there are different programs that you can use. The one that I use um, most is called DEC. Uh, it's a R package written and maintained by Mike Love. And it basically um, assumes the distribution of the, of the genes where most of the genes are expressed at zero. So it's going to be a Poisson distribution. And um, 
performs a type of uh, basically comparing between gene A in one condition and in another condition with a p-value correction and also um, you could also correct for other things like uh, batch effects say you know the experimentalist processes um, the different cells or different samples on different days we can look to see if you know the time of the day, which sequencer was used, or just any other factors that we can collect about the data to see if that has an effect on um, the counts of genes. And so those are, the, those are the type of like statistical things that I'm thinking about when I'm analyzing um, differential genes. And then moving forward towards trying to like connect the picture because you can have, you know, a list of differential genes but not really, you still not really know what's going on. And so that is where more of the nuance of what I do um, plays in. And so I am hoping to start incorporating Bayesian networks into my research to kind of like group um, genes together or group different genomic features together and uh, kind of and learn the dependency between, between certain groups and clusters with um, Bayesian networks. So out of like all of the research that you've been doing and you've talked about, like what's what's your favorite part about it? And also what on the flip side, like what's the hardest part about yeah, it? Yeah. My favorite part about this whole process is, is looking back into the literature to see like what's done um, especially from a statistical point of view, because the, the models that you can use to analyze this data doesn't necessarily have to stem from like the genomics field. So looking at like certain algorithms that were used in computer science or like for machine learning, um, for, you know, clustering photos or fingerprints or anything like that can be also applied to genomics data. And so I really love kind of like detective work going back and seeing what's been done and try and see if I can apply it to the data that I have. It's it's like really fun for me and I didn't think that was going to be fun for me because I don't like reading typically and that process takes lots of reading and like kind of like connecting the dots and like experimenting basically and but that's like the most fun part for me um, and the hardest part I think would have to be maybe like a mixture of organization and communication. Um, because I'm a computational biologist, I often like am like waving between more computer science things versus more like biology things. And so I have to learn how to communicate to both audiences in a way that everyone understands what I'm doing, especially like within my lab so that way, if I'm interpreting something, if I have people in my lab who are more familiar with the study systems that we're using, they can understand, critique, and give helpful feedback for what I'm doing versus if I'm talking to a more like statistics, computer science um, audience, they can give me feedback on that side of what I'm doing. And so that's kind of really hard because it's hard to gauge where everyone is at. And you sometimes you can explain something that's make it too simple and then it just kind of erases like the fine details of things which are really important um, to make sure those fine details are correct in order to say like okay these results are valid and so that's like organizing my thoughts in that way and communicating in that way is probably the most challenging part of of the of the process so far yeah yeah no that makes sense um is there anything that you do to better communicate to both like the computer science audience and the biology audience yeah yeah so i am a very visual person and so whenever i make like presentations for our audience i always like try and like make my models very graphic or you know just have things moving on the slides or whatever to kind of explain what's happening because when i get to like physically show my understanding of it it can also um, help to uncover like parts that i don't understand either and so that's helpful for me to say like oh i actually don't understand how that's working let me look into that more or if i like 
animate something incorrectly, my audience can tell me, oh, that's actually not how it works. And then I could go back and take that feedback and re rerun an analysis or rethink about the problem that I have. So for me, it's pictures, just put things in pictures and then also have the details um, on the slide as well. But the main point of it be something graphical. And so that way it opens up for people to ask questions um, in a way that they kind of see where my understanding of it is and we can build and go from there. But it, it's, yeah, it's really hard. Yeah, just explaining research and, or anything that you're working on, I guess that someone isn't as familiar with is always a struggle because they, I mean, they haven't been working on it as in depth as you. So um, trying to communicate it well to them, that way they can understand. So yeah, as a visual person, I love using pictures too. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it tends to be um, easier to understand, like, it's not like people have to like read paragraphs of yes. something and like a lot of technical terms. It's more like, yes. oh, you can see like the trends or like yeah, yeah. photos. I, I definitely would advise to stay away from technical terms or I, I try really hard not to use them. Sometimes you have to, but like when I'm speaking to a broad audience, I try to use like analogies and broad terms to kind of more better, uh, discuss what is actually happening versus like the fine details of like the techniques of what I'm doing. So instead of saying like, I'm using a Bayesian network clustering analysis to understand blah, 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 blah. I'm just saying like, we're gonna cluster these things and see how they, you know, how their interdependencies kind of work, you know, trying to use words like that. And there's definitely a time and place for everything. So when I'm speaking to like my committee, where it, which is, you know, experts in the genomics and statistical field, I feel more comfortable using those words and harping more on the fine details versus a general audience. You want to kind of like bring it back out and definitely keep the bigger picture in mind. In terms of like your day to day as a researcher, are you mostly, you know, just coding and using software or is it a lot of talking with people and um, communicating with them on, you know, results or data. Um, what what kind of work are you doing? What's that? What does that yeah, break down look yeah. like? So day to day um, looks very different now since we're in a pandemic. Um, I work from home. This is my office, <laughs> um, and so I tend to talk with. Uh, the people in the lab that I work with a lot because I'm not an expert on the specific techniques that actually gets the data to me. And so it's um, super valuable to keep those lines of communication open in order to like understand the nuances of the data, like to see if there's something I need to correct for or like some weird thing in sample two that I need to like look out for or something like that. And so um, I like to start my day like checking my emails, my messages, and then kind of like putting together like a to-do list for my day or for the week. And then um, just going through those items, meeting with people and actually spend like I, my, my projects kind of come in waves in terms of like how much I'm coding. And so if I'm like just starting a new project or a new leg of a project where I'm running a different kind of analysis, I'll probably spend a couple of days like tweaking or coming up with a script and tweaking it. And then from there on out, it's like communication with the other person to make sure that I have the right assumptions that I'm looking at something the right way and like fine tuning the, the analysis script. So like I would say most of my time is actually not coding, <laughs> which which is why when I get to a point where I'm like reading and trying to put together a new analysis, that's like the exciting part for me because I'm like coding and trying things out. And that's, I, that's fun to me. Um, how long does each project take? Is it, I, I'm not quite sure what the timeline is for. Yeah, projects. yeah. So these, these projects take a long time. Um, for me, I've pretty much been bouncing between two different projects um, 
in the last two years, um, they're definitely big multifaceted projects. So they're not just like, okay, what's the difference between A and B? Um, they have like within one project has five different uh, types of analyses that have to be tweaked specifically for the data that we're using and for the question that we're looking at. And so it takes, it takes a while. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know how to like think about it in terms of time. One of, one of the projects is finishing up and we're just working on that last leg. And then you have to work on writing it up and making sure that's all good and producing nice figures. And so it's definitely a very iterative process and it definitely, takes a while not because like it's a huge project from the beginning but because like once you get one set of results you're like oh that's interesting okay let's ask this question next and let's ask this question and you can ask questions forever with the data so you kind of have to be like all right this is it this is what we're going to present to the world <laughs> yeah that's a good point there's like I feel like it's it's interesting because you can always keep asking more and more questions and dive deeper into yeah. the research and analysis and the data and yeah. Well, yeah. how do you how do you determine like what that stopping point is? Of, yeah. Do you stop asking questions? I think the stopping point. Uh, that's a good question, and I don't know it. All the I don't know how to answer it. Um, because I haven't had much experience with a project from start to finish. I usually come in at some point and duck out at another point. But I think once like the data that you have can no longer answer those questions, that's like, okay, it's time to move on or like collect more data and then carry forth with another project. But I don't know. I think that, I think that different themes of research can definitely sustain a lab um, for, for a very long time, like decades, um, if you're willing to continue to collect more data. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, depends. Yeah. <laughs> what skills are the most important for, you know, just across the whole research process with a specific project? I will have to say clear communication and organization hands down um, you have to have metadata you know i have to have everything clearly labeled and understanding what certain you know acronyms mean to the experimentalist and the computational person because you can you know i could run through a whole analysis with a data set and you know, think one thing about the data and then go back and present all these nice results and then have someone say, oh, wait, that's that's not what that means. That's actually supposed to be in that group and that means that and that was at this time point. And, you know, so it's really, really important to like have, um, have an organizational scheme where both parties or both sides of the of the computational biology coin can look at and understand and come to an agreement on like what what is what um i've definitely run into a lot of uh issues or not issues but like obstacles where there was just a blatant misunderstanding on like what is what and you have to just redo the whole thing and so like definitely that's probably the most important thing to me regardless of industry I feel like that's always something that's like super important is there like do you have any tips on how to kind of go about resolving um like miscommunications or um just being more communicative in general I think that um like if like me and your peers in a lab and we're working on a project together I definitely think it's it's something that um, whoever's in charge of both of us should kind of sit down with us and be like, okay, let's discuss the, the research plan, let's discuss the analysis plan, and so that we're all on like one page. Um, but if that doesn't happen, I think me and you should sit down and talk about, you know, what's what, where, where does it go, what are we looking for, how do we want to analyze this, or, you know, 
together creatively um, come up with a with a process or a pipeline on how to handle things. Um, I think it just takes it just takes one person to just sit down and be like, hey, can we like meet over coffee or over Zoom, you know, to talk about these things? Um, because it's 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 just a simple conversation. Uh, everyone has their like assumptions on what's what, and so like it's 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 I feel like it's something that could be easily resolved. So just just being okay with saying, yeah, I don't I don't actually know what this means. Can someone explain this to me or something like that? It's no harm in it. I guess just looking at grad school and your PhD in general, what what made you want to do it in the first place? My last year in college, I like fully realized that I wanted to do research. I did like undergraduate research experiences and they were fun. And then I think some of my last year, I learned more about like epigenetics and um, I took this one amazing like biostatistics course and I was like, wow, I, I want to know more about this. I want to study this. What do you mean all of our cells have the same DNA, but they express different genes? Like what is controlling this? And they're different in different populations. Like how, and it's reversible sometimes. Like how do we, how do we control this? How do we use this for medicine? I had so many questions. And so I like, I knew that I just had to go continue school. Like it wasn't like an option. Like I just had to. And luckily I'm from the, I'm from, or I, I live in the Triangle area in North Carolina, where there's like UNC, Duke, Research Triangle Park, um, NC State, lots of like big pharma companies as well as big research institutions. And I, I knew I wanted to stay in the area. And so I just applied to all the programs in the area and um, I got into Duke and I was like, this is the place for me. So that's how that happened. Yeah, that's one thing I've heard a lot about PhDs. Um, like, you might not necessarily be using the research in the future because it is so very focused yeah. on a specific um, topic. But yeah. the skills are the things that carry forward and Definitely. thinking about problems and even just because because you're kind of you're like you're doing research that no one else has done before. So coming up with that and solving. Yeah problems um yeah I so which yeah. I, I wanted to say that sounds a lot more intimidating than it is like <laughs> I remember going into like the like preliminary exam stage of my um PhD and like thinking like oh, they want me to come up with this grandiose idea of like how to solve cancer or something like that you know like and I was just like I can't I'm, I'm just me how am I going to think of that and really what it is is like you can simply take a technique or an algorithm or something that's already been out there and just like push the envelope a little bit further so you don't have to reinvent the whole wheel you just got to add some like sparkly designs to them so like definitely don't look at it as something that's like super super intimidating because you can just take it a notch further and once you learn how to like take someone's existing tools and reinvent them or add add a new feature to it you'll quickly realize that like that's pretty much all research is it's someone pushing the needle just a little bit further then a little bit further and you can totally be a part of that like it's it's not as intimidating as it seems how was how was that transition from undergrad to a PhD yeah um, yeah I it was it was a pretty tough transition for me honestly I had a few personal things happen um during that transition but also the the outlook on schooling is very different when you're in graduate programs um so like me you know, I considered myself like a top achiever in undergrad and, you know, always studying, getting good grades versus in, in graduate school world, it's not all about grades. Actually, like people could care less about grades. It's more about like, 
let's try and focus on what you want to learn. How is it going to help your research? It's very much more research oriented in a in a like thesis granting um, graduate program. And so like that kind of switch of like, okay, Melissa, you don't need to memorize these things. You actually need to like understand them and figure out how to implement them. Like that was the biggest like mind like switch for me and like once I once I like was okay with like okay I'm not gonna ace every exam like it doesn't even matter what matters is that like I know how to apply this to my research that's when like I felt very comfortable and I started like feeling much more of a sense of belonging and and you know a sense of like understanding and and feeling like okay I can actually do this thing so definitely that was the biggest that was the hardest hurdle in in my transition stage so you've been like working in this tech role and working in a lab um what has your experience been like as a woman in tech it's been it's actually been okay and I think it's because of the environment that I'm in so my undergrad experience I was at at an all-women's college so like the gender gap and gender inequalities didn't even really like have an effect if anything like it was definitely very like amplified there to push women in in places of power and so I didn't really like have any issues there in undergrad um even within my research experiences I think being being amongst all of those women kind of just like further um reinstilled in myself that like I I have a place here like no one could tell me that I don't belong here as a woman like no and in grad school the um on the on the peer level and actually at the faculty level as well it's the gender inequalities have been pretty low from what I see um one thing that I haven't seen is diversity, like racial diversity in my undergrad and in my grad school, um, especially my grad school program. And that's something that I've been fighting for in undergrad. I was um, the vice president president of my Black Student Union. And so that's something we're constantly working with the other students and also the admin at the college to kind of address those issues. And then in grad school, I'm still advocating for um more black and brown people in in our programs and so the as a woman in tech it's been very kind to me but as a black woman in in tech it's been a little rocky as a black woman in tech what what have you been um kind of fighting for and like what changes do you think the industry needs to make and do better so i definitely um i definitely think the numbers are there in terms of Black women in the field or coming into the field. I think that's there. What needs to be upheld is our retention in the field. I think that there is not a lot of um, Black women in power, um, not a lot of Black women supervisors or principal investigators that people like me can look up to, to see like, hey sis, how did you get through this? You know, like not a lot of upwards mentorship in that in that way and so I think that it's super important to amplify black women's voices in this field and and amplify their careers um, so that we're not constantly being looked over and that we can tend to shift that paradigm of not having lots of representation Um, on the on the flip side of things, because I'm re- doing research and doing genomic research, I know a lot of research is not based in diverse populations. And that could be for a number of things. Sometimes you wanna control your sample population such that you are really finding the key differences and not worrying about the variations due to the diversity of you know, the samples that you're collecting. However, I think, um, there's been a lack of research uh, and for black and brown people in this country specifically. And I think that um, as computational biologists, we need to be more um, thoughtful in selecting which groups we're researching and how to go about that. And so I I think uh, it's a a multi-pronged issue. I think that there needs to be more amplification and and purposeful 
amplification of black women or black people in the field. And I also think that we need to be more realistic in the um, be more representative in how we're researching and, and how we're applying that to the entire population and to make sure that our, our research also looks like who we're trying to ultimately research for. And so um, those are those are the type of things that I think needs to be improved. And I'm doing this by advocating for my program to um, recruit from historically black colleges and universities. Um, we have a lot in the area and to um, invite more people of color, uh, women of color in, in um, specific to give um, talks um, because that's a fairly um, highly regarded um, thing on like that you could put on your CV. Like I was invited to talk at Berkeley or Stanford, like things like that kind of show that you're well, um, that you're well suited and that you're well established in the field and it thus helps you to further build your career. So I think purposeful engagement in those two ways can help to like increase diversity in the computational biology field. So you're talking about like amplification of black women's voices. Do you have any um, like role models that you in the field that um, people should hear their stories about right now? That's a really good question. I, I, there, there are a lot, actually. There are a lot of, um, there are a lot of Black women computational biologists specifically out there that are doing amazing work that you just don't, their, their names are not like as familiar um, when you're speaking to large groups of computational biologists. There's a, there's the, Black Women in Computational Biology Network, um, which is founded by um, my friend Janae Adams. She's at UPenn um, as a PhD student, and she's created this global network of women computational biologists that are doing such great things. Um, in, in that network, there's seminars, journal clubs, um, accountability partners, and there's just so many amazing women um, there that definitely needs, or doesn't need, but like whose careers would definitely be impacted by being amp having their voices being amplified. And so that's one of the main goals of that network. And I'm, I'm proud to be a part of that and help, help out with that when I can. Um, but in terms of personal mentors. I've had two um, Black women computational biologists that has really helped to shape um, my research. One uh, person is Dr. Claire Linda Williams Devane. She was like my real first like PI. Uh, I spent almost two years in her lab and uh, that's where I really learned how to code, really learned how to research and like you know, me, you can tell me to do something, I can do it, but she really pushed me to like question things and question and push those things further. So she'll say, okay, this is the data, we wanna figure this out. So I'm like, okay, cool. I can, you know, do something, analyze the data, figure that out. And then, then she'll be like, okay, but what does that mean? What questions are we asking next? And I'm just like, uh, I don't know. And so like working with her really helped me to like form that kind of like research minded, like independent researcher brain. And then another mentor of mine is um, Dr. Chantel Nicholas. She works for the EPA now, um, but with her, I worked with her at um, North Carolina Central University, as well as a um, for, not a, a contract research organization called Cytovation. And she really, she really helped me to define my goals outside of research. Um, she. She was great at reaffirming me and saying, you know, I'm talented, you can do this, but she really helped me to like put meaning to what I'm researching and always like think of that and um, have those two women have really shaped the way I look at research and how I look at the field and, and more importantly, how to, how to make an impact um, in the field and for people that look like me. And so those are my two Black women uh, mentors right now. Yeah, that's really powerful. Um, and it, it really just shows the, 
the impact that having these role models and mentors that look like yourself yeah. um like how how important that is like I mean, I think there's been research done on this but seeing someone that looks like you in the field like makes you more likely to think that you can like be like in their position and like be in that field so um yeah, yeah. and it's it, that's like a really hard concept to explain to someone that doesn't understand like it's really hard to say like, yeah, I didn't really see a black woman computational biologist growing up. So like, I didn't think that I could do that. But if you tell someone like, oh, I never knew computational biology was a thing. So I didn't pursue it. They, that would click with them instantly. But like when you add the, the, identi the identifiers of who you are to that conversation, it's really hard to explain and really hard for someone to get. Um, so like, I can't stress enough how much of an impact that had on me. Um, in terms of like moving forward and coming and introducing this more um, representative data into the pipeline and kind of getting out of this infinite cycle of bias, um, what, what do you see as like next steps of what people can do? I think money talks. So I think the government needs to fund uh, more research that does um, promote um, equitable research like what we've been um, discussing. I think that it should be a requirement in certain research fields to make sure that the data represents the population. Um, and so I think that would be a really motivating factor if if researchers had to design their studies such that it um, it was more representative, then I think that would definitely motivate more scientists to move towards that. And just just calling it calling it out more, or um, yeah, just being being an advocate in that field. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I kind of want to run my own research lab is that I'll be able to ask the questions that I want to ask and not what somebody else wants me to work on. And so I can make sure to be inclusive in that way. And so, yeah, I think money, I think uh, in those introductory grad school classes where we're learning about genomics to also have that be a part of it. So we're training the next generation of scientists to think that way. Um, just, yeah, just to be more inclusive and diverse overall, bring a more inclusive and diverse set of students in that are already thinking that way so they can push their research in towards that field, towards that, um, towards being more inclusive, I think. I think there's a lot of things that can be done. It's just, you have to put in the time and effort to do it. You are a mother and you love it. Congratulations. <laughs> um, how have you been balancing your role as a mother and also as a PhD candidate? So it's definitely has been challenging, but not as difficult as I thought it was going to be. Um, so I mentioned before that I've pretty much always lived in this area. And so both me and my husband's family live in this area. And so um, they have been super, super helpful in terms of childcare. I think, um, I think the biggest thing to really uh, be successful in any kind of career as, as a mom is to um, have a child care uh, option that works for you. So like right now during the pandemic, the last thing I want to do is send my baby to daycare. Um, so many germs, so many unknowns. It's just, it just seems like I, I don't want to do it. Even if like there wasn't a pandemic, it's really hard for parents to send their kids to daycare. Um, and so for me, what's been really helpful is having um, both of both of our moms live pretty close by and are able to help out with with my baby. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it really isn't as well for me, um, being that I'm working from home, my project is all on the computer. I can bring my laptop anywhere I go. I can breastfeed and be typing and coding or reading and researching. Um, and so 
having a baby carrier where you can strap him, I can strap him to me and do my work uh, and having um, a very supportive family to um, give me some baby free time and being and and yeah, being able to work from home and be mobile with my job um, has been really, really um, helpful in, in terms of balancing. Uh, it kind of like pre-baby, I kind of thought of it as a balancing act, but like now that I have a baby and he's 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 basically four months old. Um, he's he's kind of like a part of me. He's like it's it's just another thing in my life. Um, and it it doesn't feel like I'm balancing. Um, one of the most annoying things to me is like watching movies and where like the, the trope is like a woman has to choose their home life versus their career. And it's like, okay, why can't we have both? And I definitely think it's very achievable, especially for a woman in tech where you can, you know, if you have the ability to create your own hours as grad students sometimes do, um, bring your laptop with you anywhere. Um, and then uh, added plus, if you have the ability to be close to your family, I think being a mom in tech is totally achievable. So I, if that's something that other women are thinking of and want to do, but are afraid that they don't have the time to balance it, then I, I, I think that notion needs to be destroyed. I really do. I when I first found out I was pregnant I was like really scared to tell my boss or tell my tell my PI because I was uh, I was scared what she was gonna say like she's you know tell me to drop out of grad school or something and when I told her I was so nervous I was a ball of nerves um but when I told her she like she was so happy for me she cried a little bit she was so excited and like also having a supportive like um, space at work also is very helpful. So I definitely think there are areas or, or groups or teams in tech that can foster that kind of supportiveness. And it that's really like, that's really, really helpful. Um, Cause you know, even before baby, I wasn't perfect. I wasn't meeting all of my deadlines, you know, like everyone, you know, has those patches where it just like it seems like everything is happening at once you just can't accomplish everything and she's my my boss has been really supportive and understanding throughout that and so with the baby she's super understanding and but she's also super motivating and she'll let me know okay Melissa you need to get this done or you need to work on this I'm like yes okay I got it I got it I can do this um but so it, it really just, it does take a supportive network. And I think with that, um, women can do anything. Like there's there's nothing in this world that made me feel more powerful than giving birth. I will tell you that. <laughs> I just push the baby out. I can do anything. So definitely if people want to be a mom, I encourage that. You've been, you know, like, being in research and you've been in tech for a while, um, what what advice would you give to people who are interested in tech based on what you've learned? So my husband's also in tech, but he's more like in the IT type of thing. And we both have very different paths in how we got to where we are. And through both of our experiences, if at any stage, any point you're interested in something, there's in tech there's more than likely a, a program out there free or paid for or that you get paid for that will help to train you to become you know to learn more about that so definitely if you're interested in at any level just go for it start googling it definitely helps if you're like willing to move all over um the united states to get that experience but like just go for it just go for it. It's never too late. It's, you know, it's never too big or too small. I feel like tech, you can either be like a really broad expert in something or a, a really deep expert in something. And so like, if there's something you're interested in, even mid-career, you want to switch from machine learning to like more statistics, like just go for it. There's so many 
um, training programs online too that are out there that will help you to acquire that knowledge to kind of take that leap. Um, it's And it's really easy to display those skills online. So like you can make yourself an online profile, a GitHub and kind of like showcase the things that you've been working on. And so just just dive dive into it. That's That's all I have to say. Thank you so much, Melissa, for joining me on this Zoom call today. I feel so inspired after talking with you. Um, everyone, check out Melissa's Twitter and connect with her on there. Um, I'll link it in the description below. See you all in my next video. Bye.